Hi everyone and welcome to this chapter. In this chapter we're going to be talking about some of the basics of state management in Flutter. Um, so let's start off by going through what state management actually means. Mm. State management could mean different things to different people um, dependent on how they've used state management before and how much their experience is with it. For me state management is the mechanism by which you glue together various layers of your application. And usually that includes going through your service layer, through your business layer, and then to the UI layer. So it's that glue that brings these three layers together. You may have more layers in your application or you may have less. You may only have a simple UI layer in which you may not even be bothered using any type of state management. Uh, if your application doesn't, for instance, depend on any data coming from a backend. So it is a very fluid definition. I wouldn't say that state management can just be explained by one sentence that's globally accepted. So, um, But for me, state management is this substance that brings various layers of your application together. And, and to a, an extent, it can basically affect how you write your application because um, you can't completely always silo your various application layers from your state management. So what we're going to do in this chapter is going to talk about some of the built-in ways that Flutter allows you to manage state uh, internally. Um, so we're not going to be dependent on any type of state management uh, packages in this chapter. The only external package that we're going to use is a UUID chapter, as you'll uh, sorry, um, package, as you'll so soon see. Uh, and um, apart from that, we're not going to be dependent on provider or block or anything like that. So uh, what we will develop in this chapter is a very simple application in which we will try to um, display a list of contacts um, defined by their uh, names, whether it's a first name or for, last name or full name. It's just a name property that we're going to define in a class uh, called co contact. And we're going to display these contacts on a list view. And we're also going to have a second view in which you will be able to add new contacts. By adding new contacts, those contacts will be displayed on the list. And, <clears throat> and you will also be able to remove contacts from the list using Dismissible in Flutter. So what we're going to do first is going to go set up our uh, project. So I have a terminal window here. I'll bring it right there. Increase this. I'll do some <clears throat> reshuffling of windows here so it will be easier to see what I'm doing. There we go. So let's go ahead in here and say Flutter create. Um, and we call it vanilla contacts and course. Dash dash org is SE pixel. And this is just something that I enter in the, for my applications. And this is, I've explained this in my free Flutter course, which is available also on YouTube. But this is just like your organization, which is going to also be used for like your packages when you build your application. So it's always easy, easier to provide this in the beginning when you create your project than to have having to, for instance, go and change it later. So let's create our project here. And I'm going to CD into that um, vanilla contacts course. And I'm going to bring up Visual Studio Code. And since Visual Studio Code has a built in, um, so I'm going to delete this actually so we don't have that. Um, since Visual Studio Code doesn't, uh, it basically um, has a built in terminal, we don't have to have a separate terminal. So what I did here, I mean, I can actually see that I, I seem to have had that project from before. And that's why all of this was in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my terminal actually, and go ahead and do that again. So we will all be on the same page. So I'm going to go to um, CD here, remove that folder, uh, vanilla contacts course, okay. And then I'm going to Flutter create again. All right. So that's going to create the project from the beginning. So it's not going to be um, left over. A CD um, vanilla context course and code it. All right. So now we should be ending up with a very simple uh, application here. And 
in this course, I'm not going to be uh, going to be explaining so much how Flutter itself works. I kind of expect you to go and watch the free Flutter course, which I've uploaded on YouTube, and learn about Flutter if you haven't done that before. Uh, but I'm kind of assuming that you know enough about Flutter to be taking this course. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to delete this calendar application. And I'm just going to create a simple um, Flutter scaffold application, which has the main function, run app, material app, and a home page that at the moment just says home page. So then I'm going to select the device here on an iPhone 13 Pro simulator and just run just like that. So while this is all happening, what we're going to do is to go ahead and create a contact class. To begin with, our contact class is only going to have a name. So that's going to be defined by a final string name. So while the build is happening, let's go ahead and do that. So class contact and then final string name, just like that. I'm going to get help from Visual Studio Code to create the constructor, which for me is going to be a constant for you as well. So let's bring that there. And let's say const and um, yeah, and make this a required parameter. Okay, so it's also named required parameter. Fantastic. So the other thing that we need, which is going to be the state management we're going to use in this uh, chapter of the course, is a class called contact book. Contact book is going to be a singleton um, class which will only have one instance available in the entire application and contact book will manage the state of the contact so you can add contacts to it you can remove contacts from it you can fetch a specific contact from an index and you will also be able to get the length of the, all the available contacts in uh, this class so um, we will begin with a very simple vanilla contact book um, class it has no state management as such in it but it will just have some um, way of hiding its internals by not exposing, for instance, the entire list to the outside world. So let's go ahead and start off by saying class, and I'm going to say then contact book. Okay. I see we have a lot of space here, so let me just increase the size so we can see the code better. So by having contact book in here, we are good to go. That's the only thing we have to do with contact book class at the moment. Then what we'll do is to create a, a singleton for contact book. We just want one instance of this entire of this class in the entire application. So let's go ahead and say contact book. We will create a private constructor and we call a shared instance. Okay, just like that. Then we will create a static final and we'll call it contact book. It will return contact book and we say it's shared. Okay, and this is private as well because it's only being used privately at the moment. And that's equal to contact book dot shared instance. Okay, this is the pattern of creating singletons in Dart. It's nothing that I can influence. That's just how, how it is. In Swift and Rust, it's a little bit easier uh, to do that. It's just a one liner, but in Dart at the moment, we can't do that with one line. Then we will create a factory of contact book here, like that. And that returns this shared uh, static file. All right, so that's the singleton pattern for our contact book class. Um, what we'll also need to do is to have a storage for all the contacts. So let's go create a simple array here. So we say final, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, final list of contacts. And we will call it contacts. And this will be an empty array to begin with, OK? Then, since we're going to be using a list view uh, in our application, uh, we will basically need to expose the number of contacts that this contact book at the moment is holding on to. Uh, because the list view, using its builder function, as you'll soon see, we will need to actually expose the item count to the application. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go here and just say, as the code says at the bottom of the screen, int get length. And that's a contacts. All right. So that's for that. After that, we're going to create a simple add function. This add function, the only thing it does is just takes a contact and adds it to this contacts list. All right. So let's go ahead and say void add and required contact. Call a contact like that. And in here, we just say contacts add contact, just like that. All right. So that's our add function. 
Then what we'll also have to do is to create a function that allows the user to remove a contact from this class. So let's say remove, and then in here we just say remove, and that's it really. It's very simple. It's always uh, almost the same code as add, but it just changes the add function to remove both there and here. And then we will also need to have functionality here that can return a contact using its index. But we're not just going to expose contacts as subscript using this function. We're actually going to make this function return an optional contact, and it will return that contact if that contact's index is actually in range. So let's go ahead and do that. So we say an optional contact. <clears throat> we'll say um, contact here. Oops. Contact. And we will just say required int at index. All right. And in here, we would just uh, say return. Or maybe we could just make it an arrow function in here. We just say arrow. And then we will say contacts length more than at index. Then we will return contacts at index. Okay. Otherwise, no. So let's save this. And I'm going to decrease the size of the editor a little bit because it was just ginormous. So what we're saying is that it's an error function, so it doesn't require any return statement. Then we're saying this is a ternary operator, and it's saying that should the length of the contacts be more than the index provided, then we actually return that item at that index. Otherwise, we return all. Simply means that if you have one item inside your contacts array, the contacts length is one. But if you provide an index of one, it means you're actually requiring the second item in the array since indexes are zero based. So in that case, your index will actually be more than the length, which is one. So actually equal, it should be like this. No, no, the length should be more than the index, right? Because if you say one, then one is actually, and this is one as well, then it's, it's not more. So yes, so if, for instance, you have two objects and you request index one, then that will work, right? So because you have two objects and the index of one is the second object, so it does make sense. It's a little bit strange, but it does make sense. All right, so that's that function. What we'll have to do now is to work on our homepage. And as you can see at the moment, homepage is a simple scaffold at the moment uh, that just says homepage. So let's bring up our application. And you can see our application looks like this at the moment. What I like to do in the iPhone simulator sometimes is just to go and say Windows, stay on, on top. And that makes sure that while I'm working with Visual Studio Code, then this uh, simulator stays right there. You could, of course, also go and change the size of your uh, editor, and that will work too. Okay, And then we don't have to do that. Uh, all right, so that's that part. Um, what you'll need to do for your homepage, as I'm showing here, is just to create a simple scaffold. Nothing fancy. We don't need a body at the moment. So just a scaffold with an app bar will do. Then what we're going to do in here is to create a simple list view uh, using its builder. And for item count, use contact book length. All right. So let's go ahead and take care of that. So app bar is app bar, and then we'll say body. and in this body, we're going to return the list view. But before that, let's get uh, our contact book in here. Contact book is contact book. So we have an instance of our contact book. And remember, this is a singleton. So it's not going to be initialized over and over again. And for the body, we're going to say list view builder like that. And the first thing we're going to do is to provide the item count. All right. So item count that is equal to our contact book length, just like that. All right. I mean, it is complaining at the moment simply because we haven't provided the item builder, but we're going to take care of that soon. Then what we need to do uh, is to actually provide that item builder here. So I'm just going to say item builder and see if you can get some help from Visual Studio Code. And we can't. So let's see the structure of this item builder. It takes a build context and an integer, and then it has to return a widget. OK, so we say context index here. And then we will just return some widgets in here. OK. So as you can see at the bottom of the screen, we have to return a list tile. So I'm just going to say list tile. All right. 
And for the actual list tile, what we're going to do is to get the contact first. So for every contact, we want to create a list tile to display inside our list view. So for that, we need to use this little function that we wrote here, which is the contact at that specific index. So let's go ahead and say final contact is um, contact book. And then we'll say contact and then it requires an index and we'll say index. And remember, this is an optional and this is going to return an optional contact as you can see here, but we'll force unwrap it like this and it will just be an actual contact. All right. There's other ways of handling this, of course, but we're not going to go into the details of that because this is not really just, a f I mean, it's not a Flutter course. Uh, I have to be kind of specific about what we're focusing on. This is a state management course, so we have to work on the state more than we actually work on the internals of how Flutter and Dart work. Now that we have the contact, let's go ahead and create a list tile here. And for the title, what we're going to say is just a text of that contacts. Contact. All right, so that's that. I'm just going to save this file. Um, and yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine now. So as you can see, we have no contacts in here. What we could do is to go ahead and actually create a contact to test this. You don't have to do this, but I'm just going to say foobar, OK? save the file and actually going to hot restart as well. And then you can see FUBAR is actually displayed there in our list. But since we don't have a way for any context to be added to this list right now, it's empty. So what we need also is to have a way of adding new contacts. And the way to do that for us in this course, right? Sorry, in this example is to create a floating uh, action button, FAB or FAB. So we have the body here, then we're going to say floating action button is an instance of floating action button. And on press, we're just going to say it's an empty function for now. All right. And its child is going to be a text. Uh, actually, let's add an icon. So we'll say const icon of, actually, you can't see the code. I apologize for that. So now you can see the code. It's a floating action button, and it's on press right here, if, in case you didn't see that code before. Um, and here's the child. And then we're saying an icon with icons add, something like that. OK, and save the file. And there we go. Here we have the floating action button. Perhaps I could change the size of the simulator so you could see it like that. So you could see it in its entirety without my face blocking it. All right, so we have the plus button in here. We can press it. It doesn't do anything at the moment. And um, at, at, as you can see, it's action, which is on press, is empty at the moment. So <clears throat> what we need to do is to actually work on a way to be able to add new contacts to our application. And the way to do that is for us to create a new stateful widget. All right. So let's go ahead and create a new stateful widget in here. I'm going to call it STF and Flutter stateful widget. And we're going to call it, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, is new contact view, just like that. All right, so um, that's fine for now. And the next thing we have to do for the new contact view, remember, this is the view that we're going to use to add new contacts to the contact book. And uh, for now, what, what this guy is going to do is just going to have a simple scaffold with a column. So let's go ahead and here. So let's say we return a scaffold and it has an app bar and its app bar says uh, just title of const text, add a new contact. Okay, I'm going to save this and it looks like this at the moment. So nothing special and its body for this scaffold, we're just going to add, as you can see at the bottom screen, we're going to just create a simple column. So let's say body and column and children empty at the moment. All right. So, and we're going to ignore this const literals right now. All right. Perfect. And what this new view is going to contain is a simple text field. And it's also going to include a button. The text field is going to allow the user to write the name of a new contact that they want to add to the contact book. And also the button is going to let them to, it's going to be a CTA, it's going to be a call to action. Pressing that button, it will contact our contact book 
a class and it will add that new contact with the given name. And that is the reason right now we've created a stateful widget because we need to actually manage a text editing controller. So in order to control, in order to grab the text out of our text field, we have to create a text editing controller. So let's go ahead and take care of that right now. So we're going to go into our state object and just say late final text editing controller, and we're going to call it controller like this. Okay. So now that we have a good controller, we also have to go to our init state in here and just say controller, text editing controller. So initialize it inside init state. And upon dispose, we're also going to get rid of it with controller.dispose, just like that. OK, then what we'll have to do is to create a text field inside this uh, columns children. And this is going to be a text field using which we're going to grab the user's input. So let's say we're going to have a text field in here. So we say a text field, OK? And its controller is going to be our controller just like that. And it's going to have a decoration, decoration, and it's going to be a const input decoration, just like that. And it has a hint text. And for the hint text, we're going to say enter a new contact name here. So let's say enter a new contact name here, OK? With dot, 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 or something like that. I press S. Now, we're not seeing this view at the moment because we have no route for it, OK? OK, so now that we've done that, we have to add a CTA, which is call to action. So this CTA is just going to be a text button. So let's go add that right after text field. And we're going to say um, text button like that. It has a child and it also has an unpressed. So that's that. And its child is just going to say uh, const text uh, add content, just like that. All right. And Upon unpressed, what we're going to do is to create a new contact. So I'm just going to say final contact is, <clears throat> uh, let's say it is a contact. And it has a required parameter that says name. And we're just going to say controller text like that. Then we say contact book. And then we're going to say add. And we say contact, OK? And we also have to. Uh, pop back. I don't think I've mentioned it here uh, in the notes at the bottom of the screen, but what we'll also have to do is to actually, yeah, I, I've written it that pop back too. So, <laughs> so let's go ahead and just say navigator of context, and then we just pop, all right, with no values returned. So this is us upon pressing the button, creating a new contact, adding it to the contact book, and just popping back to the previous screen. Okay, perfect. So what we also need to do is to be able to go from this screen that we're at the moment to the new contact uh, view screen. We have to define a route. So let's go ahead and take care of that. Um, and we're going to do that inside our application up here, material app. And let's go ahead and say routes. This is a map of string and widget functions. Um, so a function that takes a build context and returns a widget. So it's kind of like a map of, yeah, it's a complicated one. Its keys are strings, which is the name of the route, and its values are like um, a function. So quite cool. So let's go here, and we say routes is a new map in here, OK? And we have a new route called new contact. And in here, remember, this has to return a widget. So in here, we just say const new contact view. All right, just like that. OK. Um, and then we have to go to our floating action button in here to its unpressed. Uh, let's see if we find our floating action button here, unpressed. We have to send the user to that route. So let's take care of that. So we say um, navigator off context, uh, context like that. And then we say push named, all right? And it's called slash new. Um, just like that. And I believe push name is a future. So let's just change our function to async and then we will await on this. All right. Just like that. So I'm going to, since we've changed the main function of our application, we also have to do a hot restart. So I'm going to do that hot restart right now and then press the plus button. All right. And I'm just going to type something in here. Hello. And add contact. 
So as you saw, nothing happened on the screen. And that is simply because the homepage has no idea about how to grab that data. And that is one of the fundamentals of state management. You're trying to glue together two completely different paths inside your user interface. Uh, state management, management doesn't necessarily have to be about user interface, but it is one of the ab absolute fundamentals of bridging the gap between your data and your user interface. So we need to work on this. And we need to actually grab that data that the second screen new contact view uh, widget created after putting it inside a contact book, we have to refresh our home page. Okay. So before we get started with all of that, let's go ahead and do some um, work on basically marking where inside this uh, solution we are by creating a Git repository for our application. So I'm just going to bring up terminal here and let's go ahead and say git init to create a new repository here. And then let's commit our code. So I'm just going to say git add all and git commit step one, just like that. All right, so now we've committed our code. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about uh, state management. So we're getting to that point that we can actually talk about how to bridge this gap. Um, what we need in this chapter is something that Flutter calls a value notifier. A value notifier is a a class, as its name indicates, that it can manage a single value. In this case, the array of contacts that our contact book at the moment is managing. At <clears throat> any point that this value changes, it will send a notification outside to all its listeners. So it is this kind of like a pattern where it contains a value and then other classes can listen to that to changes to that value and then up there update their logic um, accordingly. So you may not be familiar with value notifier, and that's why I think it's important for us to actually have a look at its internals a little bit together. So let's go ahead and just write anywhere inside your code, just write value notifier and then command and click on it. So we're going to have a look at its, um, actually, maybe we can't do it anywhere. Let's do it inside a function. And I'm just going to say final. Value notifier, notifier, just like that. And then let's go into the source code. You can see here, I mean, there's lots and lots of information that you can read about it. But you can see that value notifier is actually extending a, another class called change notifier. And it implements a value listenable. And if you go to value listenable, you can actually see it's an abstract class value listenable. So it's kind of like a mix in. And that value listenable itself was a listenable. So you have to think about listenable, value listenable change notifier, value notifier. And if you look at change notifier itself, it's listenable. So change notifier is to listenable what value notifier is to value listenable. So there are very basic building blocks of change notification and kind of like the absolute basics of dependency management in Flutter. And they work very, very, I mean, it's, it's their implementation is actually quite simple. All they're doing is that they're keeping hold of some data. And when those data points change, they notify their listeners. So now that we've <clears throat> had, now that we talked about that, we can actually have a look a little bit here at the value notifiers, actual source code. And you can see in here is exposing something called value. And that value is stored inside a, here in a constructor. So it's actually passed here. And then when you set the value, so this is a setter. So it's a here's a getter and here's a setter. And when you do that, it basically compares, is this new value the same as the previous one? If yes, don't do anything. Otherwise, set that value and then just call this notify listeners function. And that's just that. I mean, value notifier is nothing scary. It just keeps hold of a value. And then upon it changing, it notifies its listeners. And the key here is upon its changing. Um, it is very important for you to understand that this value notifier is actually calling this equality function. So if you want, if you have a custom object and you want to actually really be able to tell whether it's changed or not, you have to implement equality for your classes. Okay. Simply because value notifier depends on that. All right. So now that we know how value notifier works, we have to have a look a little bit. I mean, we don't have to, but it's actually nice to have a look at 
and the source code for change notifier as well. So as you can see here, this, the comments say a class that can be extended or mixed in uh, that provides a change notification API using void callback for a notification. So it is very, very simple as well. Let me go to the parts that I think are important. Here's the function that is called, for instance, add listener. It basically, this class manages a list of listeners, as you can see in here. And all those listeners have basically have a void function in here. I mean, all those listeners are void callback functions as the documentation says. So anytime things change, that void function is going to be called. Don't worry if that is kind of abstract right now for you, but just imagine every listener is just a function. A function will be called then when the object that this change notifier class holds onto or the objects that it holds onto when they change. So that's one function that's quite important. Remove add removes a listener at a given index. So when you want to stop listening, sorry, remove listeners actually calling that function perhaps. Yes, it's calling remove add internally. And let's see if we have any other here. This is very important, notify listeners. And you can see that this is the actual function where it goes through all its listeners and then calls them dynamically. So this is really cool. Uh, I've actually written a tip about this in my Flutter Tips and Tricks GitHub repository, how you can create a call function in your classes. So you create callable classes in that case. So. But we're not going to have a look at all these different uh, functions inside Change Notifier, but I strongly suggest that you, while in your journey of becoming a better Flutter developer, have a look at these different source codes that the Flutter team has created for you because it, it will give you a better understanding of how Flutter actually works, okay? What we need to do then is since our contact book class manages only one value. So it's not managing a series of changes. It's only managing this contacts um, list in here. We could use a value um, notifier instead of change notifier. So let's go convert our contact book class in here to a value notifier of list contact. And sorry about that. I'll also have to go into my notes in here. Just have a look here. Let me see. Uh, OK. I just want to make sure that I have the same source code that you're having a look at, looking uh, that you're looking at, and, and get check out that. Okay, so I have that source code as well, so I can. Yes. All right. Perfect. Because I mean, I have to also explain because I I prepared all this code before, so I kind of need to make sure that I'm on the same source code as you are. So if if there's any point I need to copy paste code, so not to waste any time, then I have to actually have that source code right here. I have a third screen right there. So let's go ahead and say this contact book extends a value notifier, and then in here you will provide the actual value type that you're managing, which is a list of contacts, right? As you'll soon, as you'll see now, um, it basically um, says that okay, you're you're extending value notifier, but it has a constructor. As you can see, it you have to pass the values that you're managing. Okay, so let's go ahead in here and we say we actually manage at the moment um, super. We manage an empty list just like that. So to begin with, our contact book has no value. And this is your chance in here to, for instance, provide if you want to read your contacts from some storage and then provide them in here. But in this chapter, we're not going to go into the details about that. But we're just saying that the contact book, when it's initialized at the absolute beginning, has no contacts to manage. All right. OK, uh, so that was that part. The next thing that we have to do is to be able to identify contacts. Um, because what we're going to do soon, as you'll see, is when we list these contacts on the screen, we're also going to allow the user to delete these contacts. And for that, we are going to use something, a widget in Flutter called dismissible. And dismissible needs a key for every contact. So it needs to be able to uniquely identify every contact upon which, upon deleting which, it will tell you that, hey, this item was actually deleted with this ID. So for that, we need to be able to identify our contacts. And name is not a good identity, because two contacts could have the same name, but potentially be completely different contacts. So for that, I highly recommend that we actually go grab the UUID package, which is freely available from PubDev. And you can bring it into your application 
without a problem. So let's go ahead and bring up terminal. And I'm going to expand terminal a little bit here and perhaps even bring it up. Let me see if I can grab the edge here. OK, so let's say pop um, flutter, pop add UID. OK, so that's going to do its work and brought up UID into our application. Fantastic. And let's go to the top of our class in here. And then we're going to say package new ID, UID dart. Just import that. OK, that's it. What we need now is to go to our contact and actually add a, an ID to it. But we're not going to expose a UUID. We're going to expose a string. So let's say string ID like this. And in here, we're just going to say ID is UUID const UUID. I think it was like this V4. Okay. Invalid const value. Oh, it wasn't. All right. Perhaps. Maybe not. ID. Is const UUID, I think that code is fine. And v4, invalid const value. All right. That simply means that I, I believe that what it means is that this v4, it, it's not, it's a function. It's not returning a constant. So we can't have a const contact anymore there. And that's okay. That's it. That's a small trade off, I would say. Fantastic. So we've done that. So what is important now is to know that now that we've convert our contact book to a value notifier, it can't have its, I mean, it's, it shouldn't really have its own contacts list in here. And, and simply because when you say a value notifier and here you just say super empty list, this value notifier in itself actually now has some, a property called value. So if you just say value, you'll see it is a list of contacts. So that value is managed by your super. So value notifier, let's see who's actually holding on to that. You see, you have, you have this value and it's stored here. So getter does this and setter does this. So what I'm trying to say, when you convert your classes to value notifier, value notifier in itself has a value, which is the, what you specify here. So you don't have to manage this anymore. Okay. So let's go ahead and obsolete that, that contacts list. So we begin by in here, instead of saying underscore contacts length, we say value length, okay? So that's the first part. Second part is to update our add function. And instead of using contacts, we're just gonna say value add, all right? So <clears throat> actually we probably have to do a few more things in here and it's not as simple as that. So what we're going to do is, uh, I mean, it is very important in here because, uh, I mean, this now we're going to go a little bit into how Dart works, but I think it's important to mention that. If you look at the source code for value notifier, it has a setter for value. It means that when you change the entire value, it's going to notify us listeners. But what we're doing here in, in here is saying we're actually changing not the value itself, but we're changing the internals of value. So this doesn't, so this code sends no set setter signal to our change notifier. So there are various ways of doing that. Uh, we could, for instance, say, um, we could say uh, notify listeners manually in here. Okay, uh, that, that's one way of doing that. Otherwise, what you could also do is to be a bit more explicit and say final uh, contacts is valid. And then you could say contacts add uh, contact, something like that. And then you say value is equal to contacts. And you could say notify listeners. I mean, we could perhaps live without notify listeners in here. That's up to, I mean, that's we have to experiment a little bit with it because it depends somehow how equality is done in uh, Dart. So if two arrays containing the same values, for instance, uh, if, if you take an array and then you add a value to it and then set it back, it is the same array. You didn't create a new array because this is not Rust. Like we're not using program, program language that is going to make copies in that sense. So Dart doesn't, like in this case, it is the same array and it is perhaps going to even be the same uh, instance of that array. And that's why we're calling notify listeners because it all comes down to how equality is developed by the Dart team 
for an array. And I feel like this is such an important thing to talk about that I'm going to actually stress a little bit on it. Okay, so we're not going to jump over this. I'm going to save this file. Uh, all right, let's see if we get any errors. Limited change time parameters and work with hot reload. Okay, let's just let's just hot restart the application and see if it works. Um, like that. All right. So I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to this build function. You don't have to do this. Okay. I'm just gonna demonstrate it for you. So let's say final array one is a foo and bar. And then I'm gonna say final array two is array one. And then I'm gonna say array two. Uh, add uh, baz. And then I'm just going to say if array one is array two, equality. Remember, value notifier is using equality in its setter function. Then I'm going to say print, they are equal. Otherwise, I'm going to say they are not equal. Okay. And you can see it says they're equal. And this is not going to work for us because we are grabbing like our value array from uh, our value notifier, adding something to it, and then we're setting it back. And that's what is happening here. You can see we're setting it back and Dart is just going to call equality on that array or list. And it's just going to be, set. it's the same. I'm not going to notify the listeners. Remember this code, this thing, if it's the same, it just returns. Okay. So, I mean, there are different ways of handling that. So I'm actually going to remove this code that we wrote here. So now that you understand how that works. So what we could do is just live with this. It's just more explicit. You could also say contacts or say value add contact and then just notify listeners. I mean, that would work. That would also work. But I prefer to be a little bit more explicit here and grab a, like our value inside something called contacts, add to it. And then we set it back. To be honest with you, we don't even have to set it back because that's not going to do anything, OK? And just notify listeners. So that's that part. Um, I hope you, I mean, I hope you enjoy these explanations. I try not to jump over fundamental explanations, at least in the beginning of my courses. So I think it's very important that we have a look at actually how things work. Because there, I could show you, like, just write some pieces of code that works. but you may be asking about why does it work this way? So I try to explain those things. So what we need to do is to also implement remove. Okay, so let's go ahead in here and say final contacts. We grab our value here and we say if contacts contains that contact. We also probably, yeah, that's fine if it contains that contact. Great. So if it contains that contact, then we say contacts, remove that contact, all right? Then we say value is contacts. And then we just say um, notify listeners. And again, this won't do any change, to be honest with you. We could remove it because, yeah, by setting that value, by setting the same array back, equality is just going to kick in and say it's the same array because it's just com comparing like the instances the memory where there are in, in the memory. OK, then the third thing we have to update here, actually the fourth thing, because we've updated length, add, and remove, we also have to grab this contacts and make sure that uh, this function doesn't talk with contacts. So let's in here use value instead. So we say value, and in here we use value as well. OK. And I would say that's pretty much it. That is really it. And then we don't have to have a separate context in here, as you can see. OK? So let's go ahead to the next point that we have to talk about. And we need to listen to changes to value notifier and rebuild our home page. Because you see in here, our list view is at the moment, it's just saying you have this amount of contact book length, and then you just build the items. It has no idea when those things change, when, when the amount of contacts basically in the list change. So we need to work with something called a value <clears throat> listenable builder. So what is this value listenable builder? We could actually have a look at its source code. Let's say final value listenable builder builder. You don't have to write this code. I'm just going to show you the source code. So let's go ahead in its documentation. As you can see here, it says a widget whose content stays synced with a value listenable. Okay. 
And that is what we develop right here, which is a value notifier, okay? So if you look at its source code, which I think is important, you can see it is a stateful widget, okay? Because yeah, it has to like rebuild itself when things change in internally inside it. So it's kind of like keeping a state. So we're not gonna go through all its details, but you can see, yeah, it has create state. It has its own state object. So it's very similar to how you would yourself create a stateful widget. So what we need is to use a value listenable, listenable builder in our homepage. So what we need here is, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, we're going to use value listenable builder inside the body. At the moment, we have list view. So I'm just going to wrap it with a value listenable builder. OK. And let's see here. Perfect. So what we need here is to actually tell this guy, you can see it's complaining that says value listenable is not found. Value listenable is like, is a parameter that you have to pass to it, which will then be watched. It is like if your value notifier that we've created on top, which is our contact book and any changes to that value, uh, any changes to the values inside that class will then trigger this value listenable build to make a new build. All right. So let's go ahead in here and say the value listenable is actually our contact book, like here. All right. And um, then we will have a builder function. So let's go ahead and in here, just say a builder. See if you can get help from Visual Studio Code to complete that. And we can't, apparently. So it has a context. It has a value and a child. And we will just in here return our list view like we did before. Okay, we just say return at the moment. All right, like that. I'm going to do hot restart as well. But you don't see any changes at the moment. So uh, that's because we haven't really implemented um, the functionality correctly yet. So let's go ahead and have a look at how we can actually implement these contacts here. And uh, what we need really is to uh, have dismissible cells. So we can't really see much on the screen at the moment, simply because we don't have contacts in our contact book. But what we need is to kind of like imagine how this is actually going to look like. When you go to this view to add new contacts, this is going to be added to our contact book. And it's going to call the add function, which in turn then calls, uh, it, it says notify listeners, if you remember from here. And notify listeners will take will tell value listenable builder to call us builder function again, and then we return a new list view. For every item in here at the moment, we're saying list tile, but what we want to do is to wrap these list tiles inside something that we call a dismissible. And this dismissible, as you can see here, it is a widget that allows you to basically swipe on an object in order to dismiss it. So let's go ahead first grab our contacts in here. So we say final uh, contacts, and we're not going to use the contact book. Instead, in here, we're going to actually say here before list view, we're going to say final contacts is value as list of contact. So this value is going to actually be the value that your contact book holds on to. If you remember, contact book is a value notifier of a list of contact. So the value that is propagated down here is a list of contacts, all right? So we grab our contacts. Then we will keep hold of this list builder exactly as it is, but inside uh, our item builder, we're gonna grab first the contact. And uh, what we're gonna do is not to go to the contact book anymore. anymore. We're actually gonna say it's inside contacts at that index, all right? And with that, we can get rid of our contact book in here because um, its item count is actually at the moment using contact books item counts. But we're going to remove that and in here instead say contacts length. All right. Perfect. So now that we have the list tile um, and the contact ready there, we have to wrap this little guy inside a dismissible. So let's go and say list tile is now a dismissible like that, dismissible, all right? And what we have to do then is to go ahead and implement this 
key here and we're going to use a value key because remember dismissal has to be able to uniquely identify every object and in here the key is important because we have the id uh, oops we have the id here in our contact remember so let's return a value key of our contacts id just like that all right so that's that part and uh for its child, I can see that we're not just going to use a list tile, but we're actually going to bring that list tile a little bit and elevate it. Uh, and for that, we're going to use a widget called material, like that. Okay. For the color, we're going to say color is white, just like that. And we're going to give it a, quite a high elevation of six, like that. All right. I mean, you could test this a little bit, to be honest with you, because if you want to test it, what you could do is to go in here and start with a contact. You could just say contact name, hello, something like that, and just hot restart your application and see how it looks like. It kind of looks like this. So you can, see it can dismiss it just like that, right? Boof. And then if you do that, I think we may get an error or something, but we didn't. If you do a hot reload, then we get, yeah, you see, this is still a part of widget tree. And this is because we didn't actually implement the on dismissed uh, on our dismissible. So let's go. So I removed that little hard coded contact. I'm going to do a hard restart. Let's go ahead and implement the on dismissed function in here. So let's say on dismissed, and then it uses it uses a direction. We don't care about the direction, but all we are going to do is just to say contact. Uh, let's see. We have contacts in there. Okay, let's just say contacts. Contacts remove. Uh, and then we're just going to say, all right. Um, we may actually call, we may have to call our contact book to do this because at the moment where we're saying contacts, we're just working with this list at the moment. And I mean, it's not, it's not so good, I would say. We probably have to use the contacts book. So, so. Let's have a look a little bit how this works. So I'm gonna just demonstrate. So I'm just gonna do that, a hot restart as well. We may have to fix this a little bit, okay? So let's go here and the first one, I'm just gonna say foo and say add contact. And you can see foo appear here because value listenable builder got called, it's builder function got called. And then I'm gonna say bar. And then I'm gonna say baz here, okay? Add a contact. And let's bring up our debug console in here. Then I'm going to get rid of bar. And then I'm just going to do a hot reload to see if we get any problems. But it seems like we didn't actually get any problems. It's like it just magically worked. Okay. And I mean, you could argue that this is not the best way of doing that. Maybe we should just say contact book. And then we just say remove a, a special contact. Okay. And that could be this contact. So. Let's test that actually and see how it looks like. Hot restart. And then I say foo, if I could spell, foo. And then I'm going to say bar. And I'm going to dismiss bar and hot reload. And that works too. So I would actually recommend that we do this rather than removing the item from the array because removing the item from array like goes around the entire logic of our contact book so i think this is like the best way of doing that so what we're going to do is to have a um, look at actually committing our code so i'm going to go to the terminal here bring it up a little bit so you see it better let's if i can grab it here okay so git status git add a, like it at all, and we say step two, like that. Okay. <clears throat> now that we've done that, then we have to step one and step two. So you can always go back to the code that you've written before and kind of compare it with the pre, like the new step, and see what you actually did. <laughs> all right. So um, as you can see, uh, I've mentioned now at the bottom of the screen, this is one of the absolute most classic ways of managing state in Flutter, where you're using like value uh, notifiers and change notifiers. And as you can see in here, we have this value notifier. And then you'll have some builders that listen for those changes. This is for very simple cases, I would say, like when you have, when you don't want to depend on any external packages and you just want to do something um, that is 
just supported by Flutter itself. And remember, Flutter has a lot more than just value notifier and change notifier, and like these builders, we'll talk about those soon as well. But um, I would say, if you're creating a simple application, you may just be able to live with this. This is good enough for you to just manage the state of your application just with these things. But as I said, state management could mean different things to different people. And sometimes state management could be a lot more than just like storing values and then propagating those changes to uh, your UI. So for that, I think it is important to keep in mind that uh, although this is good, it is quite limited. All right. So let's keep that in mind. Now let's talk a little bit about um, various options um, that are available in Flutter. Uh, as I just mentioned briefly, this is just a very small part of how Flutter manages state. And there are many other themes available that we can use, which we're actually going to have a uh, talk about. Uh, but to understand those, I think you need to understand how the widget tree and the element tree actually work in Flutter. Um, there is a really, really good talk, as you can see, I've linked at the bottom of the screen, which I highly suggest that you watch by the Flutter team themselves. They explain how the widget tree works and how changes to the widget tree can trigger different things happening at the core of Flutter. So I don't have the time to go into like details about all of that since there is a really good talk already available. So all I can do is right now just to look, link you to that talk. And I highly suggest that you go and watch that because it is very important to understand how Flutter internally works and how it works with various uh, builds. Uh, like when you update something, how it understand that something has to be built again. So please go ahead and watch this talk before continuing with the rest of this uh, course. So uh, just briefly talking about uh, these relations between widgets and the elements. So um, the element tree for Flutter is kind of like where it maps what has to be displayed on the screen from your source code. So that's your element tree. And then the widget tree is literally your definition of your widget. So when you come to state less widget, which we have in our homepage, I believe, let's have a look here. You can see it's a stateless widget. So for that widget, there is an element in the tree. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So there's no like um, ambiguity about, okay, but is that the same thing being displayed on the screen? Yeah, it is exactly the same thing that is being displayed on the screen. Uh, but when you come to stateful widget, stateful widget is a little bit more complex in that it has a stateful widget subclass itself, which usually is a constant, but it also has a state class, which is a variable. And you can have a look here. Um, I mean, variable in the sense that it can actually change. So you can here you can see it um, class new contact view state full widget. It has a constant constructor. So I mean, it kind of like a, um, it goes against the concept of a state full widget. How can it be state full if it's constant? And that's simply because it has a function called create state, which creates its state with in turn changes. So um, th then in this case, um, let's have a look at the next item before I actually go and explain more. Uh, when you call set state inside your state object, uh, what happens is that Flutter has to then recalculate the uh, element that is going to be displayed on the screen. So what it does, it takes this state object after your changes, combines that with your widget, and then it will understand, okay, what should be displayed on the screen? Because remember, in your state object, you always have access to your widget, uh, which is up here. So you can always go to the widget and say widget dot, if you want to grab something from it. So it is, it is a combination of the state and your stateful widget that creates the item that is then displayed on the screen. So the next point, as you can see in here, I've written the state objects survive their stateful widget parents being completely replaced as long as the replacement is the same type as it was before. So, um, and this is like 99.9% .9 of all the cases. So as your stateful widgets are usually constants um, and they don't change, they're almost always the same object as they were before between set state calls. So, um, 
if you if you're uh, i mean it, what you're doing by calling set state in your state objects is like you're telling Flutter that, hey, I changed something in the state object itself. Go and grab the state and combine it with the widget, which is the stateful widget, and then display something on the screen. So it's not more complicated than that, but at the at the core, it could actually be quite complicated. And it's explained very well in the YouTube video, with, which I'm really trying to avoid replicating exactly what they're saying in the YouTube video. So I think it's best that you actually have the have a look at the YouTube video to get a better understanding of how this really works. In your state objects, you always have the ability to understand when your widget is updated. And that is through this little uh, functioning here, did update widget, which you may not have used uh, so much. Uh, let's see, overwrite, void did update widget, I think it's called some, something like this. Um, let's see, this is about overwrite state. Let's have a look. And if I go here and say widget, the change dependency did update widget, sorry, did update widget. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what I wrote before. Did I say did overwrite? Did update widget? Well, I did my best. It was did update widget, but it didn't want to help me anyways. Um, so did update widget is your chance of understanding when your higher up widget actually changed in a case of it not, not being a constant. So this is something that Flutter itself uses and some state management uh, solutions that are available for Flutter actually use this in order to construct an element that is then displayed on the element tree but we're not gonna to go too much into detail about it. But I just wanted to let you know that there is a function available on the state class that notifies you when your actual super widget, which is your stateful widget changed, okay? So now you know some of the basics, uh, which we'll explore a lot more in this course. Um, we will, I, I will let you know that we're gonna be talking uh, a lot about various state management options available in Flutter and not only internally, but also as packages. And we're going to go into very, very extensive detail about all of those. So I really try to not leave any stones unturned. And we're going to go have a look at how to implement those state management solutions inside uh, Flutter. And we're also sometimes going to dig deep into their source code. So just so you know what is coming. So in this chapter, we talked about some of the basics of state management in Flutter. And in the upcoming chapters, we're going to talk more about those and also some uh, external packages that you can drag into your application. So stay tuned.